Well, it's lovely to have you here, Juan, with us uh, today. Um, it's been a long time since uh, we've just had a little bit of a catch up for like the last 10, 15 minutes. It's been a long time since we've sort of chatted like that. I think um, the first time we met was in New York. What, what did we say? Six, seven? About six, six years. Six yeah. years it's been. Six, yeah. seven, yeah. Um, where you interned with me, and uh, you've come a long way since then, obviously. It's been really interesting to sort of track your, your path, but I know that um, I would say straight out that I always knew you were. It's funny, you know, when you have interns, man, uh, as you would probably know now, you, you get an immediate impression, don't you? Yeah, you do. Yeah. You the first couple of days, I would say. Absolutely. You yeah. get that impression, you think, oh, bugger, maybe you should direct them to another career, or the, <laughs> the impression that's like, this guy's better than me. Do you know what I mean? Or this guy's going places or straight away. And I think with you, there was this immediate impression that this guy knows himself. You were studying at, you were finishing up at Pratt, right? Yeah, right. Um, yeah. There in Brooklyn. Um, and maybe you can tell um, our, our students about uh, Pratt just very briefly. Some of them might not be familiar with the school. Uh, Pratt's a design a private art school in, in Brooklyn, New York, and it's uh, it's kind of, it's a very, like, it has that college campus vibe, you know? It's, like, kind of away from the city, and uh, you get that experience of, like, being on a campus and, and uh, you know, meeting people and stuff like that. So it was, like, a really good choice for me, I think, yeah. yeah. And, I mean, it's the only school that I got into in New York. <laughs> So that's why I went there pretty much. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Pratt, the, Pratt, um, I loved that campus. You know, I had mates doing art and sculpture in there, and I used to go into the wood, wood, wood turning, the woodworks, like workshops and stuff there with my mate Ben. And you're right, it's got a real campus feel, even though it's like in Brooklyn there, it's got like a lot of houses and things around it, but you've still got that large, expansive sort of oval area in there, and it's a cool campus. Um, so you, 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 you're with me and you're always fucking, oh sorry, you're always making stuff, you know, like that's one thing I remember about you is that you always had something in your hands, even on a break, you were like making something like leather working. Um, yes. Still. It didn't stop me. And I can see it still, you know, when we look at your social media, it's still the case. You know, you seem to always be up to something. And I think that's <laughs> so busy. Keep busy. Occupy the mind. So, do you want to formally introduce yourself then? I'll leave that to you. I'm Juan Pozo, uh, design shoes for Calvin Klein 205. Uh, uh, yeah, that's it. I'm a, a sneaker nerd at heart. Uh, you know, you might call me a hype beast or something, but yeah, here I am. Lovely. Brilliant. Yeah, we. Um we, we're going to get the students to follow along your, your, your social media and Instagram there and get an insight to what you do because you are constantly hands-on into something. Um, and I think, you know, that's a really good place for us to kick off. You know, you obviously have always had a fascination with the make element, with accessory. When you're with me, you have a particular focus on accessory. I can remember it very well. Um, you made me a wallet. I think you made me, like, keychain, all sorts of stuff, man. Like, I, I remember it all. Um, so for you, you know, to get to the position where you are now, there's obviously, if you could remember back to being a student, the one question you always wanted to ask those professionals was, what was the path? You know, what was the path that took you to the position that you now hold? Well, uh, yeah, I always wanted to uh, either be like an artist or a designer. I kind of started being just like a kid drawing stuff. Um, usually the things I would draw would be like cars or, you know. And it was kind of always designed before I knew what design was, you know. Um, so, but since a little kid, I, I wanted to be a shoe designer, like a sneaker designer, always. But I didn't, I didn't want to go to the path of industrial design because it, it, it's not as... <clears throat> like fashionable to me. I don't want to be a, a designer for a shoe brand for sports, for example. Yeah. So I studied fashion instead of industrial. And when I graduated, I, I, I was looking for 
all kinds of jobs, like any job, really. Yeah. But I found one at, at Calvin Klein for accessories, for jeans, Calvin Klein jeans. And I studied, or I didn't, I, I worked there and hoping that someday it might lead to switching into shoes instead of just doing ready to work. Because after I graduated, I was so tired of clothes. Yeah. Yeah. But it was, it was great. I loved doing it when I was in school. And then um, three years, about three years and a half after I started working at Calvin Klein Jeans, a position opened up in, in the collection in one way. So I made a, a project for my boss. I kind of went behind the scenes. I, I was like looking at their mood boards and stuff, and I kind of designed my own season for them. Yeah. And I just kind of went to his desk and just kind of slipped him this folder, you know? Yeah. And then I asked for the job and they hired me to be the shoe designer for, for Runway. And this was all before Rap Simmons started. I had no idea this was gonna happen. Yeah. Uh, it just kind of like, it was all just crazy, but it's, it's awesome. Yeah. yeah, that's that's awesome. I think something that when I, any any time I'm chatting with students, it's, it's definitely something that I say. You know, like once you're in the circle, moving sideways and about, um, it's not easy, but it's you know once you're in that position um, and you're smart, um, get your foot in the door and take it from there. Which seems like you know exactly what you did. And yeah, I, I saw the I saw the opening and I just shoved my foot in. No pun intended. Yeah, no, well, I mean, do you know, it's funny um, because um, I, I had similar experiences in my career. Most people that I talk to is exactly the same thing, you know, getting that one-on-one -on -one with somebody that might be taking somebody else on in another category, another department or something. Um, I've had friends that literally started, couldn't find work, we needed an internship. They worked in, like, lit in, you know, sales showroom or with the merchants, you know, site and went from there into even into design. So, you know, as tough as it is, it, getting a break doesn't mean you're walking straight into where you have the specific area you've studied, the carry category that you've studied. It can often be, you know, moving sideways from somewhere that is just an opportunity that you've grabbed. Um, yeah, it, so, exactly a sideways move because, yeah. you know, I didn't get a promotion or anything. It was like, we're going to be designer here, designer there. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And, and do you, um, I know uh, uh, another question that the students asked at White House was um, um, in regards specifically to studies. So we've talked about your studies at Pratt. Um, you, know, I'm, I, you know, I'm not asking for an opinion, I'm just wondering about your thoughts in regards to, to actually fashion studies. Um, particularly, I think an interesting question is um, specifying while studying. You know, we've, you, these days, particularly at the larger schools, um, you can specify, you know, menswear or knit or whatever, even before a postgraduate program. Um, and I have my own thoughts and opinions on that. But for you, um, in your experience, what, what are your thoughts in regards to study, in regards to postgraduate study perhaps as well? Um, well, in my case, I didn't really find it necessary to, to get a master's degree. You know, uh, by the time I finished school, I was pretty... I became uh, pretty skeptical of the whole system, so I kind of just like wanted to start working and start paying back what I owed. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I mean, it's it's necessary for for some fields, I guess. Mm. I just didn't feel like it was for mine. Sure. Uh, well, you were fortunate to get the position you did at the time you did. I think, um, and it comes down to you obviously being just a, you know innate talent. Um, but apart from that, I mean, this day and age, getting from stepping from an internship into a position like that, and then being able, as you said, to move sideways, um, I feel like now there's more noise than ever, um, more schools about than ever. Um, in again, in your opinion. Do you have advice for those that are sort of maybe graduating this year or in a, in a master's program now um, in regards to getting internships or a placement of some kind, particularly your experience in New York? Um, I would say just, just uh, experiment, you know, just like whatever is going on in your brain, just let it out. 
see what happens. Uh, yeah. If I was if I was to apply to a job, or basically, I mean, the way I applied to this job was to create something specifically for them, kind of, or, or just show them what you could do for them, sort of. It's kind of what they're looking for. I think uh, portfolios are something that you work on and it becomes kind of like a homework assignment and sometimes I can, I can like ruin it for you. Yeah. But I think if you have just random ideas, just build all your random ideas and something will turn into something. Yeah. You know, I, it's hard. I don't know. Because no, you never know what someone's I, looking for. That's exactly right. Uh, exactly. So this is this is nice. This is good. This is what I often think about. Um, so when I look at employing, or in the past when I've taken on interns, even or some junior sort of design positions, in particular, straight out of school or um, an intern into a sort of paid position, for me it was all about whether I could see the process in that particular person. You know, whether they understood more than just the concept, but actually the process that took them there. And it was that thing that you've just said. It was about whether they were playing and exploring and getting lost and just getting it all out. Um, and then, I, uh, you know, the other point you touched on, which is vital, was recording that in some way. You know? Yeah. Being able to show that to a potential employer in a journal or process journal or portfolio or whatever it might be. And I think... Go ahead. I have a story about, uh, I was trying to get a job at a company. And, uh, I mean, this kind of contradicts what I said before, but I did a very specific project for this company to try to get a job at that company. I showed them, if I worked here, this is what I would do. This is what the product would look like. And so I showed them this very polished presentation. And it kind of bombed because... They, I mean, also, I have to say, they were kind of, like, giving me bullshit because they wanted to see, like, like all of my sketchbook, like, yeah. you know, all of my little sketches and, like, how I arrived to this idea. And to be honest, that's not really how I work. I usually have, maybe, you know, I make rough sketches, but then not too many, not, like, a whole range of things where you can see it build up but while I'm in the process of like polishing it I just fix everything so I don't have like this sketchbook filled with shoes and you know like stuff like that so that was kind of what made them not hire me um I don't know if this is helping anybody <laughs> no but, no but, I, I, you know it's funny you should, you should say that because I think it really does depend on, like any job, I guess, but who you're talking to, who you're dealing with, what the state of their business is at the time, all that sort of stuff. I know that for me, always, wherever I've worked, you know, a good example, when I was at Saint Laurent and we were, Eddie, Eddie, Eddie had just come on and well, he'd been there for a season and a bit, but, you know, when things were really starting to change there, they changed the brand name, everything else. I can remember anyone that was coming into that fold had to be employed on the basis that they were compatible with where we were going, you know? And so lo looking at people that came in, there'd be a very, it was, it was, it was a pretty harsh judgment, but just immediately from not just looking at how um, they started presenting portfolio and things like that, but the way they conversed about it and things as well. And um, very quickly you could tell these guys are going to fit in the team or they're not going to fit in the team. And, there was some really particular talent I can remember coming through the door, but just I, rem I remember thinking, they're not going to gel. You know, they are, they're better than a lot of people here, but they're not going to gel with the with the team. And so, you're right, there are a lot of factors involved, a lot. Yes. I would say that's part of the thing. Because uh, when we were interviewing, it was very, like, stiff, you know, very, like, uh, answer question, answer question. And I didn't really feel the like good vibes with them like so that kind of threw me off also sure but i think it's kind of just like you have to find your best fit you know it's it it doesn't matter if company is like grand and you and you, you your passion is to work for them or something like that at the end of the day the people in charge if you don't like 
really gel with them, like you said, it's, it doesn't work. Yeah, totally agree. Um, what's, I've got a good, I, I really like this question. I don't have the name of the student that asked it, but for me, this is a really poignant question. And it is, how do you reconcile your creative desires with the obligations of commercial restraint? Yeah. <laughs> um, sometimes as a designer, you, you, you just want to design. Like, it doesn't matter like, what it looks like. like you just want to make the well, craziest thing or whatever. But sometimes you realize a lot of those things are just not possible. And, it, you know, it may, whether it be, like, the time frame you have to work on a season or just, like, the logistics of it. So you have to adjust, and that can be heartbreaking sometimes when you have to kind of, like, like you take your design, you have to, like, dumb it down, sort of. That can be hard. Um, but also, it's, like, it's a challenge. And I think, like, if you're a designer, you kind of take on challenges, you know? It's, like, that's the fun part, kind of. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like uh, if someone's designing a spoon, they want to design a spoon that has like a more comfortable handle because it's there's a problem that needs to be solved. Kind of. That's that's how I think of it. Yeah. Uh, you always try to like. I wouldn't say compromise. I would say uh, you find it. Uh, I mean, I guess it means the same thing. But you find a middle ground between like your initial idea, what's possible, what's sellable and uh what your creative director wants Once exactly yeah but uh you know you make it work it's fun though it's i find it fun you know constantly because you you go to work every day and it's, it's things change like you know they they have an idea one day about a certain type of buckle or like something and then you go in that direction and then they they could change their mind because you know, that's just, that's just uh, art, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You're totally right. I think that, you know, the, the job that we have, um, these, these students will have hopefully soon, is one that there has to be an expectation of, of constant tides, you know, waves and change, trend, um, you know, brand heritage, whether you're recognizing that at that particular point in time or not, whether you're referring from it, etc. And there's so much, um, you know, when I think about research, you know, um, it, it's, it's such an important tool, but the amount of times we've researched for, for weeks on end and then literally just dumped everything and said, right, we're moving over here. And even though yeah. it's, it's, it's a business and I'm thinking, I've just been paid for two weeks of research and we're not doing any of it. But the reality is that is part of the process is getting through sometimes what you know you're not going to be using, you know. It's kind of like a uh, child and error, sort of. Yeah, it totally is. And I think um, walking that fine line between conceptual design and the stuff that you kind of want to be doing a little bit and play, playing at um, and um, wearability, if you like, if, if you're sort of ready to wear, or um, commerciality, that's, that's part of the, the, the excitement to me. You know, it's part of the challenge in what I do. Um, yeah. If someone had said to me, design clothes or design gear to be different that's super bloody easy you know i could design anything that was different chicken soup right. is different you know um, it's, it's it's that line man isn't it it's just that line trying to figure out all the expectations as you say from senior from um from you know brand from finance from from retail and trend you know seeing that bias frame as well um doing all those things and figuring them into the the factor of your design is part of that challenge and i find that super exciting i think were it not for that, it's what we do would be would be artistry, and that to me, there's an appeal to that as well, but it's not anywhere near as challenging, you know. And it's like you kind of have to be a psychic in a way. You have to predict what what do you think people want, like one year from now, you know, one year from today. Yeah. And uh, I I don't like to look at too, I mean I look at all the brands, I look at every show, you know, but I don't like to pay too much attention because I, I get bogged down on something that I like from somebody and then that makes me want to do something similar but but it, a year from now it's not going to be the same so that's that's also a challenge but it's fun too because I would say 
my my job got much more interesting when my WGSN account expired. Yeah. Put it that way. Yeah, totally. And, and it, it's great, you know? I mean, I don't need anything else. I have Raph Simmons, so right. I trust him. So that's it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's true. I, uh, at White House, I know that they've actually cared to stop using WGSN. Um, and I think that was a really smart move. Yeah, because, you know, they, they tell you this information and you kind of take it to heart and you, that becomes your direction, you know, instead of an outside idea, an outside inspiration that you can get from anywhere. Yeah. And uh, you just have to trust your instincts. Yeah. We used to make a joke, um, actually, when we were at Kenzo and say that WGSM and another, another one I won't name um, were the places to look at to know, to know what not to do. Um, and I think, I think that sort of sums it up, but you know, um, they're there, I guess for a reason, but I would say that reason wouldn't be evolving more around, um, what I would call, I guess, apparel, if you like, you know, or a fast reason. Yeah, exactly. Um, I just, I'm going to keep moving on cause there's some really good questions here. So let's have a look at, let's have a chat about, um, your job there at Calvin Klein, um, you talked briefly just then about working under RAF, um, and we'll chat more about that in a minute, but let's talk about what your day is like there, and what are your key responsibilities, you get into work, what does a normal day sort of um, flow like for you? Um, if it's not fashion week, or if I'm not traveling, it's it's pretty chill. We work you know, pretty much 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. every day, and we usually get to go home on time, yeah, it's it's a it's a good environment. It's a good environment. It's very. It's, it can be very corporate at times. Yeah. You know, yeah. Sometimes it feels a little stuffy, but but uh, I can't complain. You know. Yeah, it's a bit different to our side of town studio. I mean, right, don't get me wrong. This is just my department. If, yeah. if you're ready to wear, you're there till twelve a.m. every day. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. escaping it. Yeah, I, I think, again, it depends on where you work, you know, I mean, I've worked at places where it was totally un, unrealistic to think you were getting off, I mean, this isn't during fashion week or even prep for, it was like any time of the any time of the year, it was unrealistic, unrealistic to think you were getting off before eight, you know. Yeah. Um, and that was just the culture, that was the culture of the place, you know. Um, I mean, it's also because, uh, yeah, I just work in the shoes, so it's like, we're a small part of the bigger picture. Yeah. So we're not we're not always as busy, and we we sometimes we have to wait a lot for direction to come from above, yeah, and exactly. uh, to take action. So until that happens, we're kind of just there, you know, being good little worker bees. Yeah, you know, ticking the boxes to get paid. I am. Um, right. <laughs> I, 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 it's funny because you know when we work together um, in that little Chinatown studio. I don't know if you have a memory of that place or not. I, have a very fond memory of that place and the Dumbo location too. Oh yeah, you because you came across the Dumbo as well. I totally forgot that. Yeah, I I mean I I don't when I think about um, those times I, I have the the elevator guy. Do you remember him? <laughs> My brain. Do you remember the, ele the the little Chinese man that used to do the elevator? I do not. You don't remember that. him. He, maybe he took oh. the stairs, mate. But he, the elevator was literally from like 1910 or something, and it was like an old. <laughs> like elevator yeah. and he'd sit in there all day the poor little guy but um yeah I, it was funny sort of a lot of people that work with me during that time that went on and have you know worked at a number of other places the one thing that we do discuss when we chat is when you're working in a smaller brand like that or even an independent brand um going from that into the as you've said sort of corporate game a little bit more in a merchant driven game like that um the one shock that sometimes um, younger designers can feel is that corporateness. I think yeah. it's not an art I studio. Uh, I had a lot more fun in those in your studios. Definitely. Yeah. It was like yeah. A, it was just like a better vibe. We were just like all kind of like buddies. Yeah. You know, just trying to like make cool shit. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Um. Oh man, I'm getting all flashback of memories now. Getting all nostalgic. What is the studio process like for you? Um, so, 
Is that process, the, the specific question here is a good one, and it says, is it initiated by RAF, or do you submit design concepts that are yours and later molded to a brief? How do you guys work there? As much information as you're privy to say. I would say it's um, about half and half, depending on the season. Usually for, for our commercial styles, we, like, due to timing, we have to just launch things in order for them to be finished on time, ultimately. So we, we kind of have to launch a little bit earlier than what they, than when they tell us their whole, you know, concept and everything. Um, and, and, but for Runway, we, we have to wait for him to tell us what he wants. He, he will give us uh, an idea of a silhouette, a type of shoe, something, and we take that and we, you know, we develop our own, like, schedule. Um, we consult with them back and forth the whole time, and they, you know, they, they kind of guide us in regards of, like, materials and stuff like that. But they give us kind of a broad idea of what they want, and we have to, we have to sort out all the small details. Yeah. Do you work? With, do you work with particular? Um, do you work with merchants there? Yeah, we uh, not too many. We have basically uh, we have like one main merchant that we work with. Yeah, she's, she's concerned with the sellability of the things, um, but she's she's good. We she agrees with usually with what we want and that. It doesn't happen that often. Yeah, in my cool. experience, uh, like I used to do bags for for Calvin Klein jeans, Asia market, and that was like very like market driven. It was almost like we got our direction from the merchants rather than the creative director. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, which is pretty standard in in a lot of sort of of your mates and yeah, anyway, yeah. Um, it's, you know, there, there definitely is that culture, um, particularly uh, the last few years where uh, designers are very much under, what's the word, without sounding, I've got to be careful here. Um, just, yeah, I mean, merchant driven, as you've said, where the merchants themselves are very wary of listening and following to a designer um, because the mer merchants' positions, some of the students might not be aware, but their their neck is on the on the chopping block, you know, a lot more than a designer, I would say. Um, yeah. And if the num if the numbers aren't there and they're consistently not hitting um, and not performing, then their their job won't won't be there long, you know. Yeah. Uh, so it is. A, it, it's funny that that relationship between merchant and designer, um, depending where you are, but no matter where you are, finding that confidence and trust in one another is an essential part of a working studio, I think. Absolutely. Um, as designers, we're always trying to find merchants that kind of match our taste level. Yeah. And yeah. when that works, it, it works. Because uh, they'll make a suggestion based on a, a silhouette or like even a heel height. Like uh, a kitten heel is selling well and a, and a stiletto is not selling well. So we have to kind of balance that with the runway because the runway has to be stiletto, it has to be dramatic, it has to be beautiful. So that's kind of, it's an interesting kind of back and forth. Yeah. Um, Another one of those things that we balance as designers that I think keeps us turning up every day, the part of the challenge. Yeah. As a designer, you've, not, you've sort of touched on a couple, but what is the biggest obstacle um, you've had to face? I know it's quite a specific question, but something that one of the students wanted to know in particular. Is there a particular thing or a time frame or particular challenge you might face repetitively? Uh, well, personally, uh, there's been a lot of changes at my company since I started. I started before PBH bought one of them, and uh, so there was that whole thing, a bunch of layoffs, I survived, luckily, and then I, I had to kind of go into this new corporation, which was PDH, and uh, deal with new bosses and a new structure. I've actually gone through uh, 
a handful of bosses, to put it light, I would say. Um, but you just, you know, you roll with the punches, I guess. And then, and then it was the firing of, or of, I don't want to say firing, but, you know, the other designers left, and then there was like, who, who's going to come next? Yeah. What is our future? Yeah. There was a season, I think it was spring 2017, after our head designers left, that it, we didn't put on a show or anything. It was just a lookbook. And it was a very underwhelming lookbook. Mm. Um, and that was a kind of weird time because n- nobody knew what like what was next. Yeah. And then, of course, we had this big news. Um, for me personally, uh, making the switch from being a bag designer for Calvin Klein jeans to being a shoe designer for Runway, it was kind of like I came in with zero shoe design, like professional shoe design experience. And I just kind of had to adapt. And, uh, you know, I, I, I was like kind of acting like sort of an intern in, to begin with, just trying to, you know, feel it out and, and see, learn the process and stuff. But yeah, just like, even if you get treated like an intern, you just have to just do your best work and then you, you come out of it fine. The, the industry is, as a whole is constantly evolving and changing and mutating. And I think on a, on a scaled down um, ratio within a studio, the same as you sort of described, the same things are constantly happening. Um, and there is points in time where you just have to roll with it, but always knowing that you, this is not going to be the case forever because as much as fashion on what we see in public and uh, shop windows changes, internal structures change on the same sort of level. And um, unless you're someone like J. Crew or whatever, when you're sitting under the same CD for three decades or something, you know, but um, the, it, the level that we're at is a, very, is a different one. And um, there you have to be able to sort of fit and mold yourself to any given boss, if you like, any given structure. And those that do are the ones that survive, I think, keep their head up. Um, so remind me, did you study at Pratt specifically accessory design? Did, was there an element were you able to specify in that? No, I, I studied fashion. Yeah. Um, I did take some electives in, in shoe design and stuff like that. And my interest was, was always, I've always been interested in shoes, but, but I, I did study fashion just because I wanted to go into the, this industry rather than like a sports industry. Yeah. No, but eventually, no. you know, I just found my way here. <laughs> I, I can remember that you were a particularly good illustrator as well. Has that, has that sort of, do you think, helped you um, sort of get, get through as fast as you sort of have, or with or without? Um, uh, you mean illustrator the program or no, the, I mean, you're, you're the drawing? Very, you're a very good drawer, yeah. Um, I mean, obviously it helps, uh, you, you, you draw well, you can make it clearer for the factories, whoever's making it for you to really get the feeling of what you want. My, one of my pet peeves is, uh, when I go to like, say a last maker in Italy and I, and they, they always pin up like sketches from designers that have worked with them, you know, you know, Manolo Blahnik or whatever, or Pierre Hardy. If you look at their sketches, it's, it's like weird. It's like, it's like a weird shape, a weird proportion. And they expect the factories to read that as true, but that's, that's not the case. It's a nice drawing. It's, you know, it's like has this little artistic flair, but it doesn't, at the end of the day, it doesn't really get the job done as efficiently as possible. Yeah. So I think like being precise is important, and uh, you know that's that's got to be one of your skills. You got to be very good at illustrating exactly what you want. Yeah. And being an accessory designer before a shoe designer is was so helpful for me because I was when I began I was uh, an accessory designer in the beginner level. 
So mainly my responsibility was not designing the line. I would have to spec the, the you know, every buckle, every, you know, whatever, like to the T with measurements and things like that. Mm. And just like it, it helps them understand and they get the job done faster. You don't have to go back and forth making corrections and changes. I think it's very important to have like that skill. You have to know how to, it's not just like sketching freely and artistically. You have to be really precise, I think. Yeah. I think it's helpful. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, dealing with makers in particular, dealing with the factory is an absolute art form. Um, you know, what someone years ago said to me, it was like learning to drive a car. It's um, some people come in with just some natural ability you know, being able to use the clutch and things, and others come in just completely alien to it and have to learn how to manipulate because dealing with factories is just about, you know, and it is, I often say to junior designers and to students, you do have to, to some degree, treat these masters of a craft. I'm sorry. Wait, I'm sorry. Go ahead. What? No. 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 Housekeeping, what the hell? We've got to tell everybody as well where you're staying, mate. I'm at the Park Hyatt in Tokyo. Park you want to see the, the Park Hyatt in Tokyo. Let's see the view. Let's see the view right now. Ah, that's brilliant, man. Yeah. And that's the Lost in Translation Hotel? Yes. yes. I feel very at home. We're not very lost. Yeah, yeah. I love it. I love it. Uh, uh, well, we're fortunate to get you there. Um, I think. What's that? We've lo I've lost the sound a little bit. Have you? Is the the speaker muffled? Sorry, man. Yeah, you blurry also. That's better. Okay, let's. Sorry. No, that's that. That's fine, mate. It's the way it works. It's li it's alive. It's all live. Um, so given the, this is a really good, actually a really smart question. I've just had to read through this. Um, I just want to get it right. So I'm going to put the old men on. Um, given the quality, quantity of talent that emerges out of fashion schools annually around the globe, how would you best suggest us, the students, I guess, asking it to generally stand out from the crowd in order to secure employment or even experience, what was that? Experiential learning positions, i.e. internships. Well, that's a good question, I think. How do they stand out from the crowd, considering the gross amount of competition? Well, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, if, you, if you already have an internship at a company that you ultimately want to work for, you just have to work your ass off. You have to be the nicest person. You have to get along with everybody. You have to be... Well, right now, we have this... this intern um he's he's great his name is sid uh he just graduated from parsons and this kid is just on top of everything and like i mean you don't have to go this far but he even goes as far to ask us when he goes out to lunch he asks everybody what if anybody wants anything not that that's important in the job but it's like the gesture you know it's the gesture that counts and that just sticks with people Sometimes it's a balance between your skill and your relationships with the people. But that's if you're working, if you're already working there with them. That, that just gives you the higher chance of being hired because when they're hiring someone new, they're not going to think of anyone else when they have already got a great person there. Because also, if you integrate yourself in a team, like you're already a part of it. So... Why would, why would they want to replace you, you know? Um, as far as interviewing for a position that you've never been to before, uh, it's, it's kind of objective, you know? It depends on who you're interviewing with, what their taste level is versus what your taste level is, and if you just, if you have a good vibe. And I would say if you, if you don't have a good vibe, with the person that is going to be your boss and you interview with them, then it's not going to work anyways. And why would you want to put yourself through that? 
anyways. You're going to be miserable at your job for the next however many years just because you want that brand, I guess. Um, to stand out, I don't know. It, it's You just got to do – you just got to put your best work out. Don't be lazy. Don't slack off. You know, treat like – treat your – portfolio like you're getting paid for it already yeah don't take shortcuts you know just like that is, that's, be that's, thorough. That's, that's brilliant advice yeah. that's absolutely brilliant that's, advice. Actually, yeah. that's nice man i think that um you know talking with um leanne who is the, the founder of white house um quite recently you know she sort of nailed it when she said that um one thing to sort of be a designer and be creative but if you don't have that marriage of professionality on top of that the hard working the understanding of language the hierarchy in in business all that sort of stuff then your chances of permanency in this industry are quite slim and it's absolutely true that intern that you have that asks everybody before he goes out in my experience that that's the one i want working for me and sometimes it's not even if that person is the most talented it's because I've got talent around me all the time, you know. It's like sometimes it's about we need it. We need the the one kid that that is the always going to be here last, you know. I want to be clear when he asks, I literally never ask him to bring me anything. Because <laughs> like, I, I, I don't I don't like that, you know. I, yeah. I, yeah, he doesn't need to do that. Yeah. But just the fact that he does every day is just like it just makes me smile. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. It's good. It's good advice as well. Um, is it true in your experience that who you know has more of an impact on your career than what you know or what you're capable of? Um, I think in uh, today's world, uh, I know we're going, to, we're going to talk about social media later, but that, that kind of plays a part in, uh, I guess, the opinion people think of you. And maybe it could take you to higher places. Of course, everyone knows. Like, if you have connections, it can be easier to get to where you want to go. Yeah. That's privilege, you know, no matter what color. But, um, but, shit, I'm blanking. Um, I think, I mean, personally, I don't know anybody. Yeah. Okay. I don't have industry connections. Uh, I mean, not when I started. I I just I just did the work, mm. you know. I didn't have any person to refer me to a certain company or a certain director. I just I just did the work. Yeah, yeah. I think that um, the, the answer to that question is probably that there's room for both. Like you said, if you've got the network, it's privilege, and if you don't, there's there's opportunity there as well. It's what you do with it. But if you have the network and you don't deliver, then it's going to be very short-lived anyways. Yeah. That's true. So Absolutely. if you have the network, I would say take full advantage, but you can't, you can't slack. You know, you got to be on top of it. Yeah. You still got to work. It's just a little harder for, if you don't know anybody, it's a little harder because you have to prove yourself in a way. Mm. But, you know, just, just do it. Nike. Do you, do you do it, Nike? Is it, like, do you, you mentioned social media there. Um, and one of the questions that we had is specifically in regards to that. The question, I'll read it verbatim. It says, how do you see the internet in general and the platform of Instagram having impact on the industry? What we design, how we design, how fashion is being digested. And do you think it will continue to have as much impact as it already has in the future? I think it's going to get... Bigger and bigger. Uh, I almost said worse. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know if that's if that's true. Yeah. Um, my generation, I kind of like, I kind of like grew up in the transition of that sort of. You know, Instagram started like 2009 or something. Yeah. I just graduated high school. You know, so I probably didn't really get into it till about sophomore year of college. Yeah. And so, and uh, my Instagram is full of just young kids who, like, they don't even have to go to school. They, they gain a following. They're doing something that resonates with people. And they have a platform to, to spread it out to the world. Where before, it wasn't like that, you know? Um, 
I think young people now have a huge advantage because they they literally grew up with that since they were probably I don't know how how old are uh, you know people were born in the year two thousand or something. I don't even know. But uh, but yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. I I, I I'm addicted to Instagram personally. I can't help it. I look at it every two minutes. Yeah. Um, my feed is mostly industry shit, yeah. uh, shoes, runway, whatever, yeah. and just what's on the streets. Kind of. I think um, the downfall of Instagram or, or like social media, I wouldn't say downfall, but kind of the the information gets spread. Everybody sees like a look and they gravitate towards it. And eventually everyone looks the same. That's the only thing I would see that's like negative about it. But, you know, it's weird. It's a weird world. Yeah. I think, um, we, I'm going to, sh- we'll share your Instagram because I do really like your Instagram. It's an interesting one. Um, and, uh, we'll we'll share that with the students and get them to um, have a look at it. I think um, I'm, I'm I'm the same as you, mate. Like I didn't obviously um, being your senior <laughs> some years. I didn't grow up with it either, mate. Like I'm, you know, but I am I'm addicted to it. Um, and I think it is what you say. It's sort of that constant. Um, it's an, it's this nourishment of concept. You know, you're looking for something new as a designer all the time, and you keep seeing flashes of it. Not 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 particularly on fashion focused accounts it could be on anything um i like ceramic i like watching pottery instagrams you know like that's the thing at the moment for me um to me like looking at these it's just this feeding feeding like different ingredients to put in the next recipe you know uh, but you're right sometimes it, it, it can bring it can take you along a path and if you're not too smart and you're not realizing you got to pull the horses up and go wait a minute if i'm following this shit that's already on social media by the time it goes to market it's gonna be well you know, well behind. So you're right. You know, it does have its downfall. Predominantly, I see it as a positive thing as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, just like people having information is, is positive at the end of the day. Like, you can learn anything on the internet. So, I mean, sorry to the people that are in school right now, but, you know, maybe it's not so necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, but no, it's it's good to be in school. You, you get you have access to tools that you normally wouldn't. And, uh, you know, that, that helps you learn. Like, for example, I was, I studied fashion design and, uh, like I, I wanted to focus in menswear, but Pratt put us through everything. I had to make lingerie. I had to make swimwear. I had to make everything. And ultimately that, that like, it taught me a lot of skills, but it also taught me what, what I want to do, like it kind of helped me find myself, I guess. Yeah, it does. You're right. Make, be, train to be a universal designer not only teaches yeah. you what you're good at and what you like, it teaches you what you're not good at and what you don't like. Um, and I think that's, I think a, a program like Parsons, like White House, um, with that universal designer outcome in mind is really positive. Um, I personally wouldn't employ somebody that hadn't studied. That's just a, I'm not saying that for any particular reason. I, I think that um, it's more than, to me, it's more than that piece of paper. Um, there's a discipline and a time management skill that comes with studying, I think. Um, but I'm not contradicting what you're saying. I totally agree. You can self-educate to any end. Um, but I think, you know, to some degree, it's, it's innate. The ability to design and create is an innate thing. You can be schooled and trained and farmed and you know grown in a particular area of it. But for me, at least, there's other skills that you learn while studying that I think, you know, you yourself even might have, you know, um, I don't know whether you're always quite an organised person or not. But to be able to apply those things that you learn at a tertiary level into a corporate structure, for me at least, was a lot easier because I'd studied. Yeah, it's true. It's true because uh, even if your professor is uh, kind of trying to direct you in a way, you learn how to how to deal with that, and that helps with with the job. Yeah. My point was, if I guess I'm saying, 
maybe the maybe the internet is easier for self starters, like people who want to just create their own brand, their own marketing platform, and build it that way. Yeah. But eventually, yeah. once they blow up, they're gonna need to learn how to how to deal with all that stuff, anyways. Yeah, that's true. Do you, so, can we pause? I have to plug in my computer real quick. Yeah, do it, mate. Go for it. Um, I'll just sneaky plug mine in. Um, while you while while you're running around the room, I'll just have you thinking about the next one, um, which is a flow on from that. And a, a student had asked, um, "Do you think having this is a this is a very you know generation specific question? It's quite funny, but do you think that having a high Instagram following today, and I think." Um, I want to think a little bit outside of just fashion design right now because some of the students that we're talking to might be doing fashion, um, thinking fashion marketing or um, creative direction and styling and those sort of areas as well. So outside of them as well, do you think in general um, having a high following um, works, as a, works as a reference point for career possibilities? Um, I think in certain fields, like in certain marketing, or PR, I think I think it would help. You know, I think it would be impressive to an employer to see that you know how to, you know, create your own following, or you know how to put out content that is interesting to people. Yeah. Me personally, I don't have a big following. I have something like three hundred fifty. It's it's minor compared to you know other people. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think it depends on your field. Personally, I have, I've never had to make the decision to hire anybody. But if I did, I think – I don't think that would be high on my list of requirements mm -hmm. for them. Almost almost as a designer, it, it, I don't know. I almost would think that maybe they're spending too much time on that yeah. sort of. But for marketing, yeah, for marketing or PR, like we had an intern – that was in the, uh, he was in product management. He was a product management intern. And he has, a, he's like a, he has a crazy following. He's all over New York. He's friends with all of like the rappers and the, you know, the, the influencers and stuff. And so we're like encouraging him. Like you should, you should really try to get into PR. You know, that's, that's the field that I think that benefits. Um, I don't know. Unless, you know, I, I would be impressed if, if your Instagram is nothing but design, like nothing but sketches, and you have a high following, that would be impressive. That would be, yeah. But, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think I never used to look at that sort of thing um, when taking people on or conferencing about employment, but sometimes now when it comes down to a decision between one and another, we might look at some social media behind the candidate, but... Um, I think the other thing is what you said. If someone's, if they're a designer, you're right, and their Instagram is like polished as fuck, you know, like I'm like, where are they getting the time to do this? Um, there's definitely that thought as well, man. I'm just going to throw this on. I'm getting cold. Um, but I think that um, you're right, creative direction and style in that sort of area, um, art direction, um, you know, it, it serves as another portfolio, I think, in some regard. For those. For I think it definitely helps. Virgil, you know, uh, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. But I would say, like, I mean, look at Margiela. He's a ghost. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, because he's not involved in the company anymore, but he, he didn't need to be, like, in the public eye to be a genius. That's know? right. That's right. And I think, you know, there's, there's, there's other examples of, of, you know, Martin Margiela type figures. Um, and more often than not, to have somewhat of that sort of mystery behind you creates more of a brand longevity. I mean, look how well the, the, the house has done in such a short period of time. And I think a lot of that mysticism, you know, not having to prove themselves established, um, has really worked in their favor. I mean, as we've known, you know, Margiela's an extreme example of that. Um, yeah. But it's uh, what two pictures of him on the internet. That's it, right? And a yeah. friend of mine, um, Gonzo, worked worked there for years. And um, he, like when when the press would come and interview, the, they would be pulled into a room, and in that room there would be everyone from like six different people representing the studio. There'd be like um, 
interns, junior designers, category heads, and they're all wearing their lab coats, sitting around the table to meet the person coming in the room. And the journalist would always sort of be a bit taken back and then start to ask the questions and it would be like a news conference. Whoever the question was sort of directed at would answer because it was that sort of design democracy. And and I think now under, under um, G- um, Galliano, I think that it's changed somewhat, but even he is sort of, you know, following along in that mantle, funny enough. Yeah, he's kind of disappeared in the way. Yes, he totally has. That's, it, I think it's worked for him as well. He, the, the stuff coming out is brilliant. He should probably not be behind the camera. Yeah, yeah he's not served him <laughs> too well. <laughs> um, this is this last this is a sort of question that was actually there's a couple in in this this area here. Of course, I wanted to talk about your thoughts and um, sort of sustainability. And um, according to the business, of, according to business of fashion, um, you know Calvin Klein has initiated a stronger move towards sustainability. We, you know, obviously a lot of businesses, particularly um, a lot coming out of the States in the last sort of year and a half, um, have really had this sort of vocal PR, strong PR stance on sustainability, labor conditioning, etc. cetera. Um, is that something, I mean, I don't know what you can and can't discuss, and that's totally fair enough, but have you become aware of the sustainable alternatives to raw materials, for example, that you're currently using? Is there, are these discussions that you guys have? Well, um, I would say, personally, you know, not we don't go so far as like like the hippie mentality where everything is hundred percent hemp or whatever it is. But uh, there are steps that they they reduce or they help with our time management and our budget that ultimately lead to sustainability in a way because for example, one thing that I'm pushing right now is uh, like three D rendering. We can instead of going and sampling 20 different shoes, we can have them 3D rendered based on a sketch or a a last shape or something. And we can present those and and kind of like, you know, move forward, some things get rejected. But we don't have to spend the the whole time actually making a sample, which takes a lot of effort, a lot of waste, you know, a lot of, consumption yeah. i think that helps and even in a in a very small way it helps absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's very beneficial to us because we save a lot of time and money um but yeah but if the old way was to uh you make 20 samples and 70 percent of them get rejected and that's just waste altogether i think moving forward in that way using technology and in, in clever ways like that can help Ultimately, um, unfortunately, like from a material standpoint, uh, sustainable materials, I don't think the technology and the demand of the customers has met, you know, the alternatives, say. There has to be, there's some kind of meeting point where these will all meet together. I don't know where it is. I don't know when it will come. Um, but... Yeah, like 3D rendering is a big step for me, especially in sneaker design, because when we design a new outsole, we have to make molds, we have to go through several trials, and it just takes a lot. So to be able to show like our creative directors this image, and you can rotate it, and you can see from all angles, and they get an idea of what it will look like, it reduces the amount of waste, but you know it's still minimal in, in, in regards to like the bigger picture. Well, I think uh, yeah, yeah, it's going to take a lot of time to really get to a point where brands can really do that economically, you know, without breaking the bank. Yeah, agreed. I mean, as you say, it, 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 the reality is, and we discuss this constantly. The reality is. It, the consumer model will control that. The consumer will control that. When the demand is there, it will be met. It's that simple. Um, And because the demand is still not at that point, the infrastructure is not there in terms of manufacturing to support that, and therefore the design is not there and necessary. Um, 
but it is exactly what you've said and this is something that I am very passionate about and it's something that I repeat a lot to those that I talk with that work in the industry but also um, students as well and, 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 and teachers um, and that is once you're inside the industry once you're inside the machine that's when you can really initiate change of some kind and it is the little things that you talked about one like to me what you, what that solution what you come up with there with the 3d rendering you know it's a positive for everyone you're saving money for the company um, 100 percent you're saving um, time for the company as well and ultimately you you it's a sustainable process as you say there's there's very little um, wastage so you know and I'd imagine um, all the freight involved in shipping samples and things as well is is, is, is not there so it's as you say it might be a minor thing in regards to the big picture but it's it's those little milestones that we need to be ticking off in order to, you know, have an industry that is at least f facing that direction, you know. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's just like, in general, you know, humans want to go in that direction. But there's so much red tape. It's, you know, I mean, I, I, I can't even wrap my brain around it. I just try to, like, do my job. One, I want to bring up... Uh, there's someone I follow on Instagram. He's an industrial designer. Very interesting. Who's that? Um, I think his Instagram is Nick P. Baker. At Nick P. Baker. Nick P. Baker. Yeah. Um, what I love about him, he, he, he just does like sketches of uh, furniture designs and stuff like that. Yeah, Nick P. Baker. Yeah, got it. Yeah, got it. Um, he he posts these videos. He's using virtual reality to design things, mm -hmm. and he, it's fascinating. Yeah. He has one he has one post that's a, a sneaker design, and he, you can see him in the VR drawing it out in front of his face. I don't know you if know? you can see that there, but that's exactly what you're talking about. I can yes, see it. that that's so fascinating to me. And that's that's an example. That's the technology that can be so beneficial to us. Yeah. But it would, you know, it has to catch up. It has to be mass. You know, I, I would love to learn how to do that. Um, I sometimes I feel maybe I'm a couple years too late on that wave. But that that to me is is like what I'm talking about. Yeah. To be able to see something in 3D so you don't actually have to waste all these resources just to make a decision, just to be like, no, that's ugly. Yeah. You know, you have to, you know, I think that helps. I mean, for me, yeah. it's... Sure. It ha that has to be in every office, in every company, and every employee would have to be trained in that. That's it. Yeah. And it's... um. For me, I mean, it's something that the now the interiors um, industry, architecture industry is using. It, it goes hand in hand. Um, obviously, they can't test build massive structures, so it's ideal for them. But um, it really is the ideal, that 3D rendering in particular, the software that's available now and the, the capabilities of it are absolutely ideal for our industry. Um, the amount of factory visits that we could cut down, the amount of mucking about in communication with manufacturers and the mis potential mistakes and wastage that occur um, from doing something like this guy's doing, you know, is phenomenal. And I'm the same as you. I feel I'm very envious of those young um, students coming out that have the ability to do that. You know, yeah. um, I think there's there's, and if you're not studying it right now, I would even recommend say get on bloody YouTube and have a look at it, man. You know, like. Get your teeth into it. Cool. There's, um, let me see. I think we've sort of, we've chatted, I think we've really covered that sustainability question well. Um, you know, the questions about, you know, labor conditioning, fairer wages, all that sort of stuff goes into what we've talked about, being a part of that machine and sort of um, promoting change from within, which is where real change um, is accessible and can happen. Um, I want to ask you a couple of personal questions before we finish up, man. Like, in terms of what you do um, at the moment, what you're designing, um, do you um, have a particular favorite product potentially that's on the market recently for, that you've worked on? Well, I've worked on, I mean, I'm completely biased with using my Instagram, but... <laughs> I've seen uh, it, yeah. Yeah, so my childhood dream since I was probably 12 or something was to create a sneaker. And I've finally done that. Uh, 
It's releasing April. It's on pre-order right now on CalvinKlein.com. What's by it, the way, what's it on pre-order on? CalvinKlein.com and many other websites. You can get it on uh, Neiman Marcus, Luis Villaroma, Antonioli. You know, everywhere, everywhere that they sell Calvin Klein 205 West 39th NYC. And is it Carlos? Is it the Carlos? No. The Carlos. That's that's my middle name. That's it. It is. Yeah. That's baby. It. I knew that man when I when I saw that actually. I knew that was your middle name. I don't know why I knew that, but yeah. I did. Probably just from documentation way back. Yeah, I have a pair sitting right next to me right now. Can I see him? Is that possible? Sure, sure. This guy right here. Oh my god, look at that. Yeah, the back shot. And they're and they're, they're and they're on pre order now, are they? What's my what's my actual chances of getting a pair of them at some point though? Or is this gonna be like the L V Arch light or something that we don't get ever to market? And, uh, just go right now. Go right now with the website. Oh man, I'm onto that. And the color the colours that you have on your Instagram and also the one you've just shown me are brilliant. Congratulations, man. I know it sounds really fucking odd, but I'm actually really proud. Um You've just done so well in this short period of time, and it's been an absolute pleasure to see that progress. Um, I feel like an old man talking to you right now, but I remember and I know the family that you come from, and you're a family guy, and I, I remember that about you. And I think um, you were great to work with back then, and um, you know, um, it's been an absolute pleasure to see the progress um, and I'm glad we've stayed in touch you know um, and I hope we continue to do so and I know the students although we're not live at the moment they'll be really appreciative of your honesty and um, your um, your advice today um, I think that it's not that far in the past that both of us were probably at that same position where we're just like eager what do we do next what do we do next and I think for these students there's just this hunger to get into something but also that real intrepidness where they're like, what do we do, that anxiety of how do we get there? And it's little conversations like this that I think set them at ease somewhat and, and give them some type of directive and path. And I'm sure they'd be really appreciative to you themselves. And hopefully they'll get on social media and, and thank you for that. Um, just finally, um, the last thing that I probably wanted to ask you was, um, you know, if you could go back to that time, where we were in, in, in the Chinatown um, studio there. And I'm Dumbo as well. I, I just totally forgot about that. Um, did you? How did you get to the studio in Dumbo? Did you ride over there? Where, where were you? Where were you living at that time? You were in Brooklyn anyway, weren't you? Yeah, I was on campus at Pratt. I rode my bike every day. You are right there, yeah. And that area is, apparently that whole area has changed now. I was chatting to a guy the other day. Yeah, I, I mean, I haven't been in a few years, but... Yeah, definitely. That's like that's like a whole thing now. Yeah. You know, poor green area that just like keeps expanding and renovating everywhere. It's unreal. <laughs> unreal. Well, I'd I mean, when I get back over there, I'm sure we'll catch up. But if you could get back to that Chinatown studio and sort of um, six, seven years, whatever it is ago. Um, and you had the ability to do it again in some way or make a different decision. Is there anything that you would do differently in terms of your approach? Um, I don't know. I mean, I would say maybe if, if things weren't going so well for me right now, I would probably say something different. Um, but no, I mean, I like that, like, I fully enjoyed working there it was i wouldn't have stayed so long if i did yeah. um yeah. it was just it was some kind of electricity going on yeah. um yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't change anything i guess i mean i wouldn't be in tokyo right now exactly exactly yeah I am. that sounds kind of spiritual or whatever but no, mate. i think it's brilliant i think it's absolutely brilliant i think that you wouldn't be in uh Lost in translation hotel room right now, you know, holding up a pair of shoes you dreamed about as a child. Creative. Yeah. Um, I'm still looking for a show. He's there on the or Scarlett Johansson. I'll let you get down to the bar, mate, and, and see what you can figure out. Oh, I tried. I tried last night. <laughs> I 
I'm sure you did. <laughs> oh, mate, it's been brilliant, absolutely brilliant talking to you, catching up. Um, and um, as I said, I'm sure the students and, and others and, and staff and, and whoever else be listening to this um, will be really appreciative of your time. And I personally want to thank you. Um, and uh, I might end up the video now and, um, and, th and say thanks. And if you want to have any final words to students or whatever, um, by all means, if not, we can just sum up. Yeah, I would just say, um, regardless of, I don't want to sway anyone's like mind, you know, just like, just like keep doing whatever you think you should be doing. And not only professionally, but like, just, just like health wise, just for your mind, you're going to go crazy if you don't. Just like keep keep doing what you want to do. That's it. That's brilliant. Perfect. 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 And I think Perfect. I'm going to wrap up and end it on those words. Um, one, Pozo Carbon Klein, thank you very much for your time. Um, we'll be talking to you again hopefully shortly. Thanks, mate. Peace.